studies have shown that when you are passionate about your work, you're that much more productive. And I think that passion doesn't necessarily have to come from the work itself. It can also come from what it allows you to do. Welcome to Crazy Good Turns. I'm your host, Frank Blake. And on this episode, we feature Graham and April Smith. These are two extraordinary individuals who originally came to my attention through a magazine article that discussed their practice of reverse tithing. Now, most of us know about tithing. It involves giving away 10% of what we earn each year. They do reverse tithing, which means that they only keep 10% of what they earn each year. They give away 90%. A very radical concept. You'll hear about that in this episode. You'll also hear about an amazing restaurant that they've set up in New York City in Times Square called P.S. Kitchen. You'll hear about their relationship with a group called Generous Giving that celebrates generosity. But mostly what I think you'll hear about is a life provocatively lived. And by that, I mean their lives provoke the question of, could I do that? What would happen if I became that generous? What would that feel like? I hope you'll enjoy this episode. These are two wonderful people, and they have a wonderful story to tell. Graham, April, welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Let me start where the article started, uh, which is on the notion of reverse tithing. And the article says, Graham, that after getting a lucrative job in New York, you made a series of unusual life decisions that ended up with your giving away most of the money that you earned. Would you give some of the background on that and what led you to that and what it felt like? Sure. So I had a professor at Wheaton College in the Chicago area who would always tell us about the golden handcuffs where you develop such an expensive lifestyle that you actually can never quit your job and so in effect you're you're stuck. So when I moved to New York uh, to take the job at Credit Suisse, I was really conscious of that and found about five other Christian guys where we decided to all live together. I was in a bunk bed and shared a room with two other guys. So I was paying $400 a month in rent where my other Credit Suisse analysts, uh, you know, we're paying 3000 a month for a studio across the office, you know, made the intention of living with community and living, you know, low expenses. And basically, with Credit Suisse paying for your food and whatnot, I, I realized I had the surplus that I started prayerfully trying to not accumulate and give away. And so at the end of the day, it really came out to, you know, living on 10% and giving away 90%. That was kind of the initial journey that kind of got me started. And uh, it was really through that, that April and I, when we first met for coffee, really connected because she was living a similar life, um, both of us in finance and wanting to give our lives away together. So the amazing story. April, maybe, do you have similar background, similar story? Yeah, it was pretty crazy when I met Graham because separately, you know, not knowing this guy existed. um, At that point, I had already been on the trading floor in a bulge bracket investment bank for almost 10 years and having gone to Haiti quite a bit. At this point, I've gone like 14, 15 times. My boss calls it my haycation. So one day I was leading my Bible study. And at that point, we had just gone through a series of videos from Generous Giving. I was really passionate about the organization. And this guy showed up. He didn't speak the entire night, except for the one time when I started going more into Generous Giving. And he raised his hand and was like, wait, what is this organization all about? Then we got coffee shortly after where we realized we were living in a very similar, wow, you too kind of way. He shared he lived in a bunk bed with two other guys. At that point, I had a single mother from Haiti and her two-year-old living with me in my room, in addition to my roommate, and just having people in our lives and trying to be, I guess, quote-unquote, as radically generous as possible, not only with your income, but space and resources and emotions. Yeah, I guess everything, because it all belongs to God. So that was our story. 
you were both so unassuming. How did you get to the clarity on your personal mission? Because for most of us, I think we hear the concept of reverse tithing, and it seems so difficult and so beyond where we are that I imagine it just requires a lot of clarity and dedication around the mission. Well, one thing for me is having grown up in a pretty simple home and a sense of gratitude that I know is from God. And at the age of 11, I got a chance to move to the States, where from my mother at the age of 11, she started working in a clothing factory already to really support her family. And I think when I first got a chance to go to South Africa in my mid-20s and taking that first two-weeker from my job and spending time at the orphanage, I really got to see the idea of like, who am I and who are my people that I get to give like this when you're in your mid-20s and you don't necessarily think you have a lot to offer. I didn't come from a wealthy family. And seeing the fruit of my gift and how much joy it gave to the kids and also really to the kids' classmates because they too were very, very generous. And they asked, Auntie April, like, you've helped us a lot, but I'd rather let's go help our friends at school. You know, this girl had this issue. This girl's parents is is struggling. Let's go help them. I think once you really get to see it's a get to and not a have to, it really becomes just second nature. And I think on my end, it's a little bit of, you know, being around the peers like one of my best friends lives in Ethiopia full time the last 10 years doing really meaningful work uh, in that country and you know growing up around people like that and um at the same time at Wheaton you know getting a lot of great theology teaching and you know one quote of sticks in my head about the materialism of you know Rockefeller the quote of you know how much is enough and his famous quote of just a little more in terms of for money and that kind of set the pace of you know going to New York really wanting to be wary of that just a little more mentality. And then thankfully, I met April probably a year in, 18 months into New York. And so I like to joke in our marriage, she's the gas pedal, and I'm the brake. In terms of how much and how radically we give, we've been married almost five years now. So I think, thank God for her because she has pushed me to be consistent. And I think we met at a great time of both really exploring what does it mean to not use financial resources for ourselves, but, you know, spread it around and be open to uh, where the needs are. Well, that was true for me, too, because people on the trading floor would always, you know, having seen me kind of grow up in this trading floor and 21 years old coming in and just, you know, at that point, they're like, what are you waiting for? Like, are you super picky? Like, we know this guy and that guy. And I would say, no, like with a super straight face. I want someone who loves God more than he loves me. <laughs> so when I met Graham, the one thing that everybody knew was, oh, apparently he lives in a bunk bed. So he's the real deal. <laughs> so he was the bunk so let bed me, guy. <laughs> so let me ask you a question. Both of you, you know, you're in New York very worldly environment. You got a lot of people around you with a very, very different outlook on life. And I think one of the things embedded in that article about a cheerful question mark is the lives you've carved out for yourselves. It's a very provocative life. It prompts a lot of questions. How do you interact with your colleagues when they ask you about, you know, the extent to which you give to others, how do you explain it to them? Do you feel like they get it or no, you just get a blank stare? Oh, it's been so fun. I think that is probably one of my favorite, favorite part of this whole journey. You know, I think God first led us to open PS Kitchen. Really, the idea was just, okay, I love to start a business that gives away all the profits so that it was sustainably fun. All these organizations I feel, you know, we feel really passionate about. But little did I know this was going to open so, so many conversations. It was completely unexpected side bonus. I would say literally probably once a day I would get coffee, most likely with a junior person on my trading floor in another division in my firm that asked me these questions of, how do I give more? What made you start this? 
How do you balance your life? And just getting to be a resource for them in this way of saying, you can definitely do this. I totally see our job is not just like what you do nine to five or seven to six. It is all of you. I see myself as somebody in finance as much as somebody who owns PS Kitchen, as much as, you know, the board chair for an organization supporting my Haiti work, etc. Because without one, I wouldn't be as excited about the other. And studies have shown that when you are passionate about your work, you're that much more productive as an employee and you go in there with a great attitude and hopefully with a smile. And I think that passion doesn't necessarily have to come from the work itself. It can also come from what it allows you to do. And really, sometimes I come, back from my, yeah, I come back from my Haiti trips and I'm like, okay, let's, let's trade some derivatives. <laughs> let's go. <laughs> Graham, how do your colleagues interact with you on this? Do you get blank stares? I think for both April and I, I don't think we say it very loudly. I think we just naturally, it comes up in different points. And so at Credit Suisse, the way April and I met actually was, you know, through this, the way I was living, you know, a coworker was really curious about it. Anyways, long story short, he started coming to church with me and loved it, got plugged into his own Bible study at the church at Redeemer. And it was one day after work that I said, well, let me come with you just to kind of see what he got plugged into. And that was the Bible study that April was running, actually. So it was, you know, through that, you know, coworker being curious, then eventually coming to the church that actually April and I connected um, and that same coworker, you know, becoming curious about the work we we're doing in Haiti. And, you know, we've probably had numerous coworkers come with us to Haiti. And one thing I found really cool, too, is that people are truly attracted to goodness. Like not necessarily our goodness, but like the things that why we're even doing this, the reason, right? None of the trips that Graham is referring to was really early on, like, instigated by me. It was people hearing about it and coming to me and say, hey, do you think I can bring my daughter and come with you? Do you think you can help me organize a trip where I bring my kids to this orphanage or a coworker bringing his dad to serve with me because his dad is a scientist that just had done some work in Haiti in the past. And it's just really cool to see how many people want in on this. And I, and I think a concrete example is for our honeymoon, we, we spent it in Haiti. And so I think naturally people are like, oh, where are you going on your honeymoon? And we say Haiti. And, <laughs> and it was, you know, part of part of the honeymoon obviously was, you know, sitting on the beach, but also the other half was actually serving in the different organizations we support. So, you know, even that little anecdote, they're like, wait, what? Like, why would you go to Haiti on your honeymoon? And then we get to talk about you know, the different organizations and the and the things that we get excited about. And so, yeah, it just causes them to say, yeah, maybe I shouldn't spend 10K going to the Caribbean and just thinking only about myself 365, right? A honeymoon in Haiti is definitely a provocative, <laughs> a provocative statement. That is great. That is great. Tell us a little bit about P.S. Kitchen and what you're doing there and a little bit of that background and story because I think that's an amazing one mm-hmm. also. Sometimes we joke that that has literally been our child. We signed the lease a few months after we got married. It's been a big, big part of our lives over the first few years of marriage. You know, one thing that we already have in agreement was that in our marriage and for the rest of our lives, most of our resources is going to be shared. It's going to be given away. It's going to be used for justice and impact. But what if we also combine our business background and create a place that is a place of generosity where people would come in and hopefully be inspired? So we, as you know, give away all of our profits, but we also use, for example, our menus to highlight various organizations that we want people to know about. Often there are grassroots, smaller organizations that can really use this PR and just have their name be known. We also use the space to hire those that are formerly incarcerated, people that have struggled with homelessness in the past, substance abuse, etc. And it's also a 100% plant-based cuisine so that it's better for the environment. Yeah, just every little corner we can find to create impact, we try to just squeeze it in. You know, we're in the heart of Times Square Theater District in New York, and, you know, having, again, say, a hedge fund portfolio manager 
have dinner there and kind of hear the story and also kind of be like, wait, what? This is so interesting from that physical space. Just different people from, say, the cast of Hamilton have come over and have been inspired. So it's fun to kind of get connected in the heart of Times Square with people getting to hear a story that says life is not about yourself and how do we think about our neighbors and those around us. Perfect. I I hope everybody who's listening to this, whenever they visit New York or if they're in New York, goes and eats at your restaurant. It's extraordinary just to have a restaurant that turns a profit. Does PS Kitchen actually work <laughs> as a as a commercial concern? Thank you for asking. Yeah, the first year was definitely tough, and there was a lot of prayers, lots of tears.、Um, but thankfully, the last six months have been really, really encouraging.、Uh, we're starting to turn a small profit, and even before we did that, just the fact that, like Graham said. We have a physical space, and also people start to really first ask questions, then they get inspired because of the space. We've been able to give away more than we can imagine from even a personal income side. So what I mean by that is, Graham and I continue our giving, you know, outside of PS Kitchen, and we meet more and more people that hear about the stories and know some of the details and the numbers that we've gone in on this space and how much we have personally sacrificed to make this happen. Then you have a conversation that's something like, "Wait, what? Why would you do this?" And once it is explained, then they kind of come alongside us. To give also probably in a way that was more than they initially would have thought or imagined. You know, one of my favorite stories of PS Kitchen is you know us being able to hire someone with a previously incarcerated background where he had gone to many many jobs and gotten declined because you know you have, you have to check that box that says I have a prison background and us being able to hire him, him being able to. Work for us. He literally, when we gave him the offer, you know, went outside PS Kitchen and just started crying. Because no one had given him a, a second chance since he'd been in prison for you know twenty plus years, in those small ways you're also encouraged by those stories of getting to actually meet the people and be a part of their lives, and then I, I think beyond that, just being a part of a community here in New York that are open to talking and thinking about it together. Do you both have a blog or a social media presence where people can follow you or gain? Insights from your mission and the clarity of what you're doing, or do you have one that you'd recommend to others? I think following us on PS Kitchen is probably the best. It's just PS Kitchen NYC.、Uh, we have a few stories there, like the one that Graham had just shared with our different staff, who has been really happy to share their experience and yeah, just to come and learn more about us. So, for people who listen to this, and and one of the reasons why I'm so thrilled to have you on this podcast is your one, your life is one series of crazy good turns. It's one crazy good turn after another, and for a lot of folks, and I include myself, it's really the things you do as a matter of course are really difficult to get to. Do you have a Advice: Something that you say to people who look and admire and respect what you do, but are anxious. What advice do you give them? Being in New York, there's a lot of comparison. There's a lot of FOMO, fear of missing out. There's a you know a type of anxiety that kind of lives in New York City. And so I think you know practically, I like to think of the phrase: the secret to living is giving. So really getting outside of yourself. You know, I think a lot of the Uh, anxiety can also be when you get stuck in your head, you're dead, kind of idea. And so, something simple as you know, a couple blocks away, there's an organization called Back on My Feet, where Monday, Wednesday, Friday, you wake up at 5:30 and you go running with people that are currently in the homeless shelter there at the Bowery Mission. And so, through that running, I try to go once a week. You get to actually hear people's stories of either this happened or that happened, but you, you build friendships with them. And so. I really think you know, just practically getting outside of yourself and looking towards others, and not not always having to climb the corporate ladder or always compare yourself, but really, you know, having that moment of how, how can I give back? Who are my neighbors?、Uh, how can I participate in looking after someone else? And I think that kind of frees you from some of the you know, at least New York City anxiety around trying to keep pace with everything that's going on. That brings up a really good point that I actually often also shared is this idea of habit. 
Graham also, since marriage, got gotten me a little bit into N.T. Wright. And just this idea of every little thing that we do really matters if each day you choose character, generosity, honesty, integrity, etc. So I think often we might end up being asked the question of, wow, how did you start this restaurant in Times Square? But it really, to Graham's point, started you know, at the age of 21, 22, mentoring up in the Bronx, then slowly going to South Africa and slowly going to Haiti. It's been a journey and it was never, the intention was never to end up to start this restaurant. It was just kind of one step at a time. I think once you get to experience and have that inside of you, it's really hard to get rid of. That is so awesome. And I can't thank both of you enough for participating you are almost definitionally leaders in crazy good turns. And thank you so much for both your story, the journey you've taken, the journey you're going to continue to take, and the advice you've given. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you for having yeah, us. Thank you for having us. Okay, everyone. We've just heard from Graham and April Smith. To learn more about them and their organization and support their mission, you can follow them on Facebook at PS Kitchen NYC. That's PS Kitchen NYC. And if you're in New York City, I hope you'll take the time to go to their restaurant, PS Kitchen. It's in Times Square, and it's a great way to support two wonderful people. Our show was recorded at Listen Up Studios in Atlanta. Editing was done by Stephen Key and mixing by Score Score in Los Angeles. Special thanks to our production team of Brian Sabin and Megan Hanlon. Until next time, this is Frank Blake, and thank you for celebrating another crazy good turn with us. <laughs> <laughs>